invited me to launch this book, which I'm very proud uh, to do and to start. Uh, so I'll be discussing the first part, which um, covers the debates on the historical sociology of capitalism, the political Marxist tradition and beyond. So um, in this part you have four interviews, the first by Charlie Post, second by Neil Davidson, uh, third Alexander Anievas, uh, and fourthly uh, Bernard Teshka. So um, I'm going to just um, be as brief as I can and just summarize the whole of historical sociology for you in about yeah. seven, eight minutes, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> No, obviously I won't be able to, so I'm just going to pick out, I guess, some very general aspects and then some more specific aspects which spoke to me in, in the interviews um, and which I think could be relevant. Uh, uh, obviously, we can discuss more later or afterwards. So, uh, for those um, who might not be aware, historical sociology uh, is kind of an old tradition which we could date back to uh, Marx <coughs> itself, although that term wasn't used at the time, obviously, it's a, more of a 19th century um, uh, later, even uh, 20th century term, and uh, it most simply would talk about the origins, uh, the development of uh, societies, the ways in which uh, on a kind of macro level and long durée, so the kind of diachronic uh, perspective of history and of societies. Uh, it's interdisciplinary in the sense that uh, it has involved a lot of social historians, a lot of political scientists, um, a lot of what now later on in the discipline of international relations developed, which uh, is covered mostly by these uh, interviews. Uh, and um, in the, there's been different kind of waves of historical sociology, the kind of uh, maybe a penultimate one to the one discussed today would be the one led by Feda Teda Scotchpole. So I'm not going to go back to those debates, uh, which were mostly, uh, the Scotch was a barbarian kind of pro approach to historical sociology. Uh, what we have here is obviously the Marxist incarnation and various debates inside that Marxist approach to historical sociology. And uh, interestingly, we have, uh, I think, in this Marxist historical sociology, people who have come from a more social history background, especially some of the political Marxists, uh, but also the history of political thought. But we also have political economists, um, and uh, I guess Neil Davidson would call himself a political economist, uh, or maybe let himself denominate him himself. But um, he also works in international relations, Benetech and international relations. So we still have, to some extent, an interdisciplinary approach here. So the debates have been kind of mostly, I think, important, that have come out and that have influenced maybe people outside that kind of niche. Uh, area have been debates of structure and agency, about the meaning of revolutions, how to uh, theorize uh, and understand uh, and possibly predict, even for some more kind of a very or positivist um, proponents, the um, event of uh, social revolutions. How do we establish the laws under which revolutions can happen, uh, what determines them, uh, etc. Uh, or how can we identify when they did happen rather than when they will. Uh, also on the nature of the state, how the state relates to uh, other elements of society uh, and other social forces. So the kind of small questions, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I'm going to try and leave all that behind, that nebulous map I've just drawn to you of trying to explain everything, uh, basically. Um, and focus on maybe the new debates that have emerged in what we some have called the third wave of historical sociology, which the four participants, the four interviewees here belong. Um, although I think the four of them actually still deal with quite traditional aspects of historical sociology, so I won't say that they've been really branching out into kind of new fields or even new regions, they're still in a quite Western, white male uh, centric um, position here. But, uh, but they definitely have laid the basis, laid the ground for, I think, uh, a lot of students that have evolved from these uh, scholars and have tried to, um, to go into new areas. Uh, new debates could be uh, had in gen uh, issues of gender, issues of race, uh, the debate of Eurocentrism, which has been quite prominent in the last few years, um, also uh, the, um, the topic of fascism, uh, also how to apply uh, potentially or transform historical sociology principles or concepts outside of the West uh, and there has been a number of studies now of societies outside the West obviously, um, thankfully. 
Uh, a big debate, and I think the one that flavours a little bit the interviews, is the debate between uneven and combined development and political Marxism. So, I imagine most of you are probably aware or to some extent about these debates. Um, I, I can't cover, obviously, the richness of these debates or their issues, but um, I mean, broadly, uh, so uneven and combined development is a kind of revival of Trotsky's concept. Obviously, it was uh, to some extent kind of largely revived in the 90s by Justin Rosenberg and taken up by people like Neil Davidson and Alexander Nievas uh, and others, obviously, uh, and beyond the Marxist field, actually, um, as well, which has been quite interesting. And um, the other um, part of the debate is political Marxism, which started uh, with uh, Robert Brenner and Ellen Wood. Um, the, uh, the label political Marxism was not one they adopted themselves. It was uh, actually given to them by people uh, and was sort of an insult. So it's not a, a, um, a label that they enjoy. And uh, Charlie, Charles Post actually refutes and rejects that label and he prefers a capital-centric type of Marxism. So there's issues with the names. Again, these are very kind of small debates. I'm going to try and move away from that. Uh, personally, I kind of would put myself much more in the political Marxist camp, so I'm going to try and, I guess, defend a little bit more that position, you know, while I'm here, uh, you know, make, take all the opportunities, um, uh, but also try and question a bit the problems of these debates, because, uh, you know, I've been talking about this debate for a long time, and I'm not sure to what extent it's productive, and, and I think it has become a bit stale, and I think a lot of people would agree with that. So hopefully we are trying to move beyond it. Um, so, trying to summarise, I guess, uh, starting with Neil Davidson, uh, who um, basically uh, is defends you know, uneven and combined development. He's worked a lot on nationalism. He's worked a lot on a uh, big book called How Bourgeois Were the, um, How Bourgeois Were the Revolutions. Um, it's not exactly the title, but sorry. Um, um, and um, so he criticises. Uh, political Marxism for being solely based on market compulsion, so that the, the, uh, the determination of the origins of capitalism, the transition to capitalism, the definition of capitalism, he argues, for, mar for political Marxists, is solely based on market compulsion, on the uh, ability um, for um, actors to only be determined by market conditions, and therefore that would determine uh, the emergence of capitalism in England in the 16th, 17th century, which is the kind of known Brenner would be this. Um, he also, he then says, well, the problem with that is that that's too narrow. Um, he criticizes political Marxists for being eccentrically narrow, um, for basically focusing only on the specificity of social property relations, which I'll um, discuss later. And uh, he argues that instead, we should talk about wage labour, market competition, commodity production to understand capitalism and he sees it as something that is more the product of human agency, that isn't just imposed by an imperative, that is uh, unintended. So he sees much more the, the role of human agency determining potentially, potential for capitalism. People inside the UCD camp differ on where capitalism started and how and even if UCD can be used only for capitalist societies or pre-capitalist societies, Again, a major debate I'll leave to the side. Um, but uh, I think it's important the fact that his definition of capitalism is also based on coercion and on, on conflict between societies, on the kind of political military upheavals. And I think that comes out a lot in Anievas as well. Um, and uh, he also sees that uh, social property relations, which are the main concept of political Marxists, uh, are seen as, uh, he considers them to be the economic aspect political Marxist. And here, this is where political Marxists will say, well, no, wait a minute, that's not what we're arguing. Um, I think what, did, what really um, political Marxists here can add is not just market compulsion, which was what Ellen Wood said, but actually market compulsion that is politically contested and constituted. Right? And that's the important difference. And that's why I guess the label political Marxist states. And that's what's important about England, particularly, is that it wasn't just the fact that capitalism arose out of the enclosures, out of the particular relationship between lords and peasants. It was because there was a state that emerged that was homogenous from the 13th century onwards that enabled those transformations to really take hold in, um, a, 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 to, to some extent, pure way. So, 
I think that political constitution aspect is really important. And this comes out in the concept of social property relations, which tries to account for the kind of legal, juridical, political, economic, uh, if you want, interstices of uh, social property relations, which are just relations between individuals, which is then um, uh, related by um, wage labour and the tools to um, perform wage labour and are then set in a set of social property relations, rules of reproduction, as Charlie Post would say. And this brings me on to the debate inside political Marxism, to kind of go even further down the rabbit hole, I guess, um, between uh, the Brenner Post position, which would look more at the rules of reproduction and think that we need to basically have some structure to the way in which capitalism uh, evolves and transforms, versus Benno Teshka and Sam Nafo, who argue for radical historicism, and who focus much more on the unintended consequences, uh, on the unintended uh, outcomes and uh, aspects of uh, various developments of capitalism in various contexts. So Post, in the uh, interview, is quite interesting because he, he goes quite in-depth about his critique of this aspect of other political Marxists and really puts them to task. And I think he really sets up a good question that we really need to answer. I, I would see myself more in the radical historicist camp, but I do think um, Br uh, Charlie raises a really important challenge here in terms of, well, if uh, there are no rules of reproduction, then how do we actually not just fall back into the kind of varieties of capitalism analysis, which is just completely random, and which is, you know, would suffer much more the criticism of Neil Davidson here. You know, at what point does capitalism really... Um, or at what point does, for example, France, which political Marxists do not uh, argue was capitalist until late in the 19th century, what makes it not go into a specific mode uh, of capitalist production? Uh, now, political Marxists would say that it's a particular structure of uh, class uh, relations, of the property rights of peasants specifically, the, the rights also of uh, the aristocracy, who have managed to establish themselves much longer against uh, the state and the peasants, uh, and vice versa. Um, but there's also something there about how we establish the way, um, you know, what sets apart England at the end of the day apart from, um, from uh, the rest of Europe. So important questions there to raise. Um, I think I need to wrap up, right, because I could go on forever <laughs> on this, and I'm just feel terrible because I've just scattered over these massive debates so quickly, but... Um, what do I just want to conclude on? I do struggle to see whether the debate between political Marxists and uneven and combined development can be resolved. And I wonder if this has hindered historical sociology in the last 10, 20 years uh, or been fruitful for it. Um, I think there are issues here about two definitions, two conceptions of historical materialism. Right, so the uh, UCD are co would be seen as consequentialist, stages conception of the history of capitalism, uh, whereas the political Marxism would be considered uh, a, a more, um, uh, if you want, contingent um, uh, and, and contextualised uh, approach to the history of capitalism. Can these be, can these be complementary? Some students have tried to combine the two approaches, uh, and I think that has worked to some extent. So I think we need to go beyond this debate to understand our different interpretations of Marx, of even the later Marx, of how we understand capitalism, and we need to be clearer on the methodological, um, uh, 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 basically, uh, opportunities of different approaches, and, and state those methodological choices uh, rather than to something that Samuel Nafe has argued before, rather than just a kind of fight each other uh, and, and have this kind of debate of my capitalism is bigger than yours, which is something I've, I've written about before, of trying to just argue between each other and, and the kind of little uh, jabs that the four, these four kind of have, have against each other are testament a little bit to this. Um, and um, I will finish there. Thank you very much. <laughs> so,